Okay, I'm Katie from Hackster. Welcome to the Getting Started with Tiny ML webinar with Edge Impulse. So both co-founders of Edge Impulse, Jan Janboom and Zach Shelby, are here today with us to share a little bit about Tiny ML and walk you through some demos of it in action. Um, Jan will be doing the presentation today and he'll be running through some demos. Um, he's an open source developer and technology evangelist working on Tiny ML as the CTO of Edge Impulse. Over the past years, he's gone up and down the stack from embedded to web and everything in between. Jan is a strong believer of open source and has written thousands of patches for open source projects, including Mozilla Firefox OS, JerryScript, and ARM Embed. Zach is here as well. He's the CEO of Edge Impulse, and he will be helping out with any questions you have during the presentation, as well as helping to facilitate the Q&A at the end of the uh, the first half of our webinar, if you haven't been to one before, will be a presentation. So you're going to get an introduction to Tiny ML, uh, followed by a hands-on tutorial. So you won't need any hardware today to follow along, but if you do have a mobile device, you can get started with the platform using that, and you can follow along on your mobile. Uh, the last half of the webinar, we will have open for questions. So both Jan and Zach will be here to answer any questions that you have. If you notice on the bottom of your screen, there is a Q&A um, section where you can just click on that and ask your question. If you have any questions throughout the webinar at any point, add any your questions there. We prefer if you write it in the Q&A section rather than in the chat, just because the chat's sometimes a little bit hard to um, go through and make sure that we've answered everything. So if you have a question, please put it in the Q&A and we'll try to get to those by the end of the event today. If for some reason we can't get to them all, we will post a link to the Edge Impulse forums as well, where you can go and ask any questions that you didn't get answered during today's webinar. Um, as an added bonus on this webinar, we have Edge Impulse is giving away 20 ST IoT discovery kits to anyone who attends this event live with us. So if you are online right now watching this, you are going to be entered into that giveaway. And um, so winners will be receiving an email after the event with more information on how to claim that prize. And uh, the great thing about that board is that it's fully supported by Edge Impulse. So you can use what you've learned in today's webinar to get started developing right away with that. Um, and there's lots of uh, examples and stuff on Edge Impulse's website as well that you can take a look at. So uh, with that, I'm gonna let Jan take over and we'll get started. All right, thanks so much. Um, so yeah, let's dive straight into this presentation. It's, uh, it's wonderful to see so many of you here um, actually to do a, a webinar without any physical presence, which is kind of nice. Um, Zach and I are um, pretty far apart normally as well. So we founded a company that is remote first. So I'm in Amsterdam and, and Zach is in San Francisco. So having the whole world working remote actually works in our favor because we're, we're used to it already. Um, so yeah, in this webinar, I want to I want to start off with a, with a short presentation, um, show a little bit what TinyML is and what the relevance is of TinyML in the current market. Um, and then we'll, we'll go straight into a demo and we'll actually train a machine learning model from scratch um, and deploy it back on a, on a small IoT device. Um, so yeah, my name is Jan Jungboom. Um, you see me here on the left um, at, a, at an event that I attend every year, which is uh, Data Science Africa. It's a summer school for um, mostly mathematics and computer science master and, and PhD students. Um, and for me, was, this was one of the first times that I, I saw the combination and the power of machine learning and the Internet of Things. Because there's lots of really smart people that know how to find patterns in, in raw sensor data. But very often they work on synthesized data sets. They just download a data set from somewhere, they get it from somewhere, um, and then they do their uh, analysis over. But rather, um, and for me as an IT developer at that point, it was very much around, okay, how can I build a device that captures data, but after I capture the data, I don't really do anything with it anymore. Um, and being in one conference with data scientists and myself as someone who's doing the IT side showed the power of harnessing both um, sensor data combined with machine learning algorithms to derive much more value from these deployments. So really cool. Um, and yeah, Zach is my co-founder, he's the CEO of Edge Impulse. Um, there we go, see him on camera, hopefully. Um, and uh, Zach and I met about four years ago while we were working at ARM, one of the largest semiconductor companies in the world. And what we saw 
um, is that there are more and more and more devices. At the moment, every year, there's 40 billion MCU CPUs shipping. And most of these CPUs are not going in your, in your MacBooks or going into your mobile phones. These are very, very tiny and small microcontrollers that go in, in objects we use every day. A typical car these days has 60 different processors sitting in them. You don't really see them. Um, my piano, you see there, um, has about six microcontrollers in it already, plus two extras for the pedal. Um, and we saw that there's much more and more and more of these MCUs being deployed. They're kind of underutilized. So about a year ago, Zach and I founded a new company, Edge Impulse, you see the mark both on screen and on my t-shirt, um, to harness the, and unleash the power of all these sensor devices. Um, so if you look at the, the current state of where we are in 2020, a typical industrial sensor, um, relatively expensive, but, but really nice high quality, these can do amazing things. We have now MEMS sensors, really tiny and efficient sensors that can measure vibration up to a thousand times a second, our very precise temperature measurements, uh, measurements are waterproof, and this one is even explosion proof. It's absolutely wonderful if you deploy it in a, in a factory. Um, and because technologies like LoRaWAN and Sigfox, uh, we can send data over 10 kilometers of range with only 25 milliwatts of power, which is also beautiful and a really powerful processor capable of running 20 million instructions a second. But if you, if you kind of look at what we actually do with these amazing devices, it's very little. Um, this device, as you buy it from the factory, the only thing it does is once an hour, it sends the average motion, what it saw on the, on the accelerometer, the peak motion and the current temperature over. Which is very little if you, if you realize that the device can measure vibration a thousand times a second. So we're throwing away lots and lots of valuable information. And the only reason is because we need to run these devices off a of battery. Um, so what we see very often is that 99% of sensor data is currently discarded due to cost, bandwidth, or power constraints. And especially the bandwidth and power constraints are very real for IoT and embedded deployments. Um, and because of that, lots of interesting events that you currently capture already with your devices get lost. Um, here's a Here's a plot from accelerometer data. And if you only use the measurements that the device that I showed earlier um, takes, which is the peak and the average uh, motion, you're going to lose lots of interesting events. So here, the only thing we'd capture is this little peak, because that is um, the peak motion that we saw in the signal. But somewhere here in the middle is something that's probably much more interesting, because this deviates from the norm. There's something weird going on. Um, and very often, developers don't even see these kind of deviation, these kind of interesting events, because we don't have the processing power to actually send this raw data somewhere to a central location, and thus we discard it. And second, also single numbers can be really misleading. Um, these are two plots from an accelerometer, uh, one where I'm doing up-down movement, and another one where I'm making a circle with my hands, with the accelerometer attached. Um, and the average motion in this signal actually for the up-down is 3.36, and for circle is the, almost the exact same value. So by only looking at this, this very, uh, very limited amount of data, um, we're throwing away lots of really interesting events. And that's kind of sad, because these amazing devices are so underutilized. Um, so the only real solution here to actually start um, doing something more with these devices is not to send raw data over the internet, because then the battery of your device will deplete it within a day, um, is to actually put some on-device intelligence. Um, so the device itself should say, okay, well, I've heard a vibration pattern that I've never, that I know that's going to lead to a fault in about a week from now. Um, or the temperature is varying in a way that I've never seen before. Or the machine oscillates different than all the other machines in the factory. These are the interesting things that I want to know. I'm not sending out sensor data to the internet because I'm interested in what the sensor data is. I'm much more interested in these conclusions that I can draw from that. Um, and if you want to have our devices keep running off a battery uh, without getting a, and without getting a really big bill from my telecom provider, I need to do this on device. And then the only thing I need to send over is once an hour, say, hey, my temperature varies in a way that I've never seen before. That's it. Um, all right, so how, how, do, how do we go from here? We know that we want on-device intelligence. 
Um, and we know that our, our normal sensor data is really messy because we have lots and lots of information. An accelerometer um, might send data a thousand times a second on three different axes. And it's very hard to program something out um, to get this information out. You know, when do we see that something varies in a way that they've never seen before? Now, what is really great at finding patterns in messy data? Machine learning. Machine learning is really great at anything you can't reason about in Excel. It's really great at trying to fit a curve through your data in a way that captures the very small variations between the different things that you try to detect. Kind of everything where you can't really draw it out in a graph and then try to find these correlations yourself, that's something where machine learning might do very well. But machine learning is also, when I, when I think about machine learning, I think about data centers full of servers doing all the big churning. Um, if you've seen the AlphaGo documentary, it was on Netflix, um, on how the, the team at Google actually built a Go playing bot. They had to develop their own custom neural network processor, the TPU, Google's TPU, and put 5,000 of them in a data center and then do the training on that. Um, and that's a lot of compute. So it seems that these two worlds are kind of incompatible. On one end, we, we really, really, really want to do on device, on device processing because then we get the interesting information. But the thing that is really good at finding patterns in this huge amount of sensor data is something we associate with uh, large data centers full of servers. Now, fortunately, over the, over the last year and a half, there's been a, a really interesting development which is the development of TinyML. So TinyML is, is kind of the father of TinyML, as, as lots of people see it, is, is Pete Warden, who is, uh, who is working at Google. Um, uh, Pete, together with Neil Tan, kind of came to the same conclusion. Neil was working at ARM uh, in the same group as me at the time. And they came to the same conclusion that, well, these two worlds are not that different after all, it's just compute. And for Pete, that realization came when um, he was looking internally in, the, uh, in Google and I realized that the OK Google keyword spotting, the thing that runs on every single one of your phones, is a machine learning model. And a machine learning model that doesn't run in a big compute, in a, in a big data center, no, it's a machine learning model that runs on the signal processing uh, little chip that sits in your phone that is always on. Um, and that's the reason why I can, I can, in this case to my phone, I can say, hey Siri, and my phone will turn on, even when the rest of my phone is asleep. So you still have great battery life. Um, and that's amazing. And, and how, how do they do that? So this tiny email movement is kind of focused on one end, focused on inferencing. So only on we want to respond to events coming in and not about training. The training of this model you know, having the millions of voices and the millions of keywords that people say to distinguish between, um, uh, between these phrases, between OK Google and Hey Siri, um, is still done somewhere in the cloud. But then the final inferencing that actually you're running, that can happen on very, very small devices. And we can do that because a machine learning model in essence, if you're training it, is just trying to find a mathematical function with lots of parameters that best matches the problem at hand, that best matches whether I can have a bunch of input data, some data from a microphone, um, and match whether I just saw, okay, Google or something completely different. So that training and getting all these little parameters right, that takes a very long time. But after that, it's just a mathematical function. And it means that a function I can just execute on anything that has a little bit of compute. And as long as this function is not too large, um, that's something I could actually run on a microcontroller. Then, then from that, after, we've, after that initial premise um, was solved, lots of other companies, including Arm, um, started working on ways to make this faster, um, ways to make this run in even less memory. So one of the most important uh, uh, things is that we realize that quantization, where you trade a little bit of accuracy for uh, a lot less memory because you say, well, I'm not that interested in all these like very tiny variations. I'm mostly looking at like what the global, um, uh, what, the, what the global state of this function is. And um, that helps. Um, then we realized that we have 
very cool like vector extensions sitting in our processors and we can utilize them to make the execution of these functions a lot faster and ways to reduce the number of parameters and making it smaller and smaller and smaller up until the moment where we're really targeting battery powered microcontrollers. So this is really made for tiny devices that run off a battery for a year or longer that need to deal with messy sensor data um, and not a Raspberry Pi that is always powered. But a really interesting movement. So this is really good for kind of everything that where you have messy, high resolution sensor data. So recognizing sounds from a microcontroller, detecting when a, when a cat is meowing. Um, Biosignal analysis, um, where you have, for example, you have a pulse meter sitting on your wrist, like, a, like an Apple Watch, and trying to determine um, whether you have good sleep or whether, you're, uh, whether your behavior is healthy compared to others. Um, or in a factory setting, detecting abnormal behavior. I have a, a, an accelerometer sitting, an accelerometer gets really messy, but nice high resolution sensor data, and then trying to find when something is amiss. So not even, and it might be uh, even, a, even a form of anomaly detection. So this could be something where um, I have lots and lots of normal data and when it deviates from the norm, that is the moment that I'm interested in it and then I wanna get a signal. I and mean, these are even kind of the use cases that we can come up now. Um, as people like to say, like TinyML does not have this one killer use case. There's all these like really nice, like small use cases where we can apply it and then move up to higher value use cases. Um, but there's also new things that we can start doing. One of the most interesting ones for me, one of the coolest things that I'm looking forward to um, is sensor fusion. Right now I can, buy a, uh, I can buy a sensor to measure vibration, but there's all kinds of stuff that is very hard uh, very hard for me to measure if I don't if I can't just buy like a normal sensor for it. If the door in my apartment opens, how do I know that? I can I can build a very complex model with lots of different sensors and lots of logic in between. But what if I can combine a barometer and a humidity sensor together with a temperature sensor and maybe something that measures airflow? And a machine learning model will combine all those parameters together and realize, okay, this was door opening. So no longer is one sensor that I read out but much rather multiple sensors, multiple cheap off the shelf sensors that can start measuring things that are much, much harder um, to program out. So, and it, this is just a start. This whole field is only a year and a half, two years old. Um, and we're seeing amazing developments already. And I'm expecting this to be, be even greater in the near future. Um, so, right, so how do we go from zero to model? Um, well, first of all, everything, but literally everything in TinyML starts with raw data. Raw data at the highest resolution if you can. If you currently, like a typical IoT device might get data every 10 seconds from a temperature sensor, that, liter that is not enough. That is not enough. If you get data from your accelerometer 10 times a second, probably not enough as well because you're losing so much of the resolution that you have here. Um, and if you lose that resolution, it means that we can't actually draw good conclusions out of it. Maybe at a later point, we don't need it as high resolution, but always start with raw data. Get, all, get the raw data the highest resolution possible, straight from your device. And how we do this for um, our development boards is that we either support getting the data through serial cable um, or just directly over Wi-Fi. But always keep this raw data. Don't downsample anything when you start collecting. Um, second step is extract meaningful features. Um, and actually this is very dependent on your use case. Um, how people see machine learning sometimes is I have lots and lots of data. I throw it in one bucket. I call a function and the machine learning model will magically find features. Um, this works, but it also means that your uh, machine learning models get really, really big because they and take a very, very long time to train. Um, and that's something we can't really use on our on our embedded devices. For us, it's much and much and much easier um, if we already get a little bit of a hint and downscale the data as well. Um, because raw data, there's lots and lots of raw data in the real world. Just three seconds of accelerometer data at 100 times a second, not even 1,000 times a second, um, is already 900 data points. And a second of audio data is already 16,000 data points. Um, and raw data is really messy. so having a way of cleaning up the data and reducing the number of features is kind of next step. So an example of that for audio is you have the input speech signal, someone saying yes, 
Um, and then I turned that 16,000 different, uh, the 16,000 data points that I get in my raw signal, and then look at a spectrogram over time. Um, and for audio data, for example, we can go from 32,000 parameters here to 240 parameters after and get much better um, results after we throw it in a machine learning model. So signal processing is really key for anything you do on device. And we see this as well if we, if you look at like a plot of some of the data. So here I had, was on one end, I was fist bumping with an accelerometer attached. I was doing up and down movements and I was drinking a beer. And if you plot that raw data, you can kind of distinguish the raw data is here on the left. You can kind of distinguish between those three classes. Um, you see up and down, there's much more movement um, in the, in the Y axis. Beer, there's some movement on the uh, Z axis because I'm moving like this. I drink indeed lots of beer. And then uh, fist bump is kind of in the middle. There's lots of power like here in central location. Um, and if I plot all of this data in the graph, I can kind of sort of guess it. But if I have to look at a single little bubble here, a single little orange bubble, do I know whether it's beer up, down, or fist bump? No, I need much more information. Feature extraction can make my life a lot easier. Um, so on the right, we have the output of a feature extraction algorithm where we're gonna look at what is the most significant data in this signal and then remove all the other noise. And here it's much easier. Here, there's very, uh, there's just very clear clusters of blue, green, and orange data. So if I have a single point, I can pretty much um, determine what it is already straight away from this. So feature attraction, very, very important. And then after that, let the computers figure it out. So I see kind of three things I want to do on device. One is classification. What is happening right now? Um, do I... If I see data from a sensor that I know is in transit, is it on a bicycle? Is it on? Is it walking, or is it currently attached to a car? That is interesting. Um, anomaly detection: is this behavior out of the ordinary? Uh, if I, let's say, I train a model on all the normal sounds that I hear in the house, and all of a sudden I hear something completely different, that is something that I'm interested in. Um, and last, forecasting: like what will happen in the future? And all of these things really good. Machine learning is really good at that. There's not a single algorithm that is the best for this. I know that neural networks are the hype right now and everyone, everyone thinks about neural networks when they think about machine learning. Um, but they're really good at classification, but there are many more algorithms. Um, and and uh, combining that in the, in the right thing and picking the right algorithm is kind of key after that. Um, and very often you might, you might want to deploy two different algorithms. Um, so for classification, as said, neural networks are great for anything that does classifications, but they're, they have some downside as well. Um, one, they take quite a long time to train. They're pretty heavy and they're kind of magic. They're a black box. At some point you have a trained neural network. You, have to, you found this mathematical formula with all the little parameters tuned, but how do you know, how do you actually know uh, what is happening inside? And if you're gonna deploy this to millions of devices, it's kind of nice to know like why the machine um, was making certain decisions. For anomaly detection, um, a more traditional machine learning approach, like a clustering algorithm, typically works really, really well. An unsupervised learning algorithm. We just say, we plot all the data that we have, we kind of draw circles around it, and then on, on lots of different axes, it's kind of a, a, an easy visualization. And then when new data comes in, I just compare it to all the clusters. If it's outside, it's probably an anomaly. If it's inside, it's probably not an anomaly. And then last, if I've, if I've deployed my model, I've extracted features, then I want to deploy this back to the device. I want to take all the signal processing code, the neural network and the anomaly detection code, and then put it in C++ files or something, something that can run on my device in the end. Um, there's lots of really, really good tools already coming out of here. So Google's TensorFlow Lite is probably the most known. So it's just a runtime for neural networks on device. Um, but your signal processing pipeline is really important too. Uh, for example, for vibration data, we have a, we have a nice signal processing pipeline in our SDK sitting. For audio data, you can use MFTC to extract data. Um, but there's many, many different ways of doing that. And then last, for other classical and all algorithms, you wanna have deployed to the device too. Um, there's a couple of caveats here. So because the devices that we typically deploy are very underpowered, they don't have a lot of flash, they don't have a lot of uh, processing power available, don't have a lot of RAM. You wanna use the vector extensions or the hardware optimizations on your MCU. Uh, as much as possible to make sure that this runs efficiently.
Um, now, the good thing is that Google and Arm and lots of other companies in the, in the space are doing this already. Um, so kind of every, every month, your machine learning algorithms get faster um, and run in less, in less memory kind of automatically just because of the amazing work that people are doing. Um, and, and new processors that are coming out, so ARM is doing the Cortex-M55, uh, actually will have neural network extensions sitting on the, within the processor. So they have specialized silicon, specialized op instructions just to run neural networks much faster. So we're only at the start. We can do basic relatively small models now, but once the, the field gets bigger and, uh, um, and we see new silicon come out, this will only get faster and better. Um, so getting started, all right. I hope you're really excited. We're gonna do this right after in the demo. How do you, how do you get, get started and do something? Well, first get some hardware. This is it's much, much, much more fun if you actually look at real sensor data that you've captured. Um, and it also shows you like where are the hiatuses? Is there a problem with your data rather than with your machine learning model? Um, so what we recommend today is if you wanna get a dev kit, um, I've laying on my desk here. Get the SDIT discovery kit. It's a really beautiful piece of hardware. If you don't win one today, um, get it for about 50 bucks. It's widely available from lots of distributors. Um, get it next day delivered. Uh, it's about an 80 megahertz processor, 128K of RAM. Um, also Wi-Fi, uh, motion sensor, uh, microphone. So really, really fully equipped development boards to capture data and then deploy it back. Um, also, we'll show it a bit, kind of any modern smartphone you can use for this. On every phone these days, you have amazing quality sensors. There is a really good accelerometer already on your phone. There is already a really good microphone on your phone. So um, as a way of exploring the world of TinyML, the world of machine learning and sensor data, just take your smartphone and, and start working on it. Um, or last, if you already have a dev board, uh, you have something where you can already get data off, um, it's really easy to post some data straight to Edge Impulse. Um, as long as you can get raw sensor data, maybe from the serial, um, if you have an Arduino that you can get some sensor data off, just post it to us um, and we'll help with that. Um, these are kind of the three options that you have today. Um, and that's where kind of what Edge Impulse comes in. So we do not want to be a competitor to TensorFlow. We are not going to optimize the way that we, uh, um, how fast it's going to run. ARM is much better at that but we try to help with everything that's hard around that. We try to be kind of data science tools for people that are not data scientists. Um, so we have an SDK to capture data from your real sensors in real time. Um, we have, um, my chat window is in a way, we have a way of like building a data set that's really valuable and track that um, and share that within your organization. Then enrich your data and generate the ML process. So doing both the signal processing and the learning uh, and the learning phase, the machine learning model. And then finally ways of like testing this. So actually have real-time device flows and seeing whether the, the model performs nice. Um, and then finally deploy that back to device. So we can give you just optimized C++ code that you get in Flash. Um, for both those flows, we've got really nice end-to-end -end tutorials, both on vibration and audio at docs.impulse. So you see Dan Sitanyake, one, one of our guys, um, who trained a machine learning model on detecting whether a faucet uh, or a sink is on in your house. Really cool, it's just a small model you can build and it actually works like straight in your house, even when you're locked up because of Corona. Um, so with that, I wanna, I wanna switch over to demo um, and we're gonna actually build a machine learning model here together. So, all right, so this is Edge Impulse. Um, our homepage. Uh, so what I need is a, a dev board. So I got the SDIT discovery kit uh, laying here um, and I can log in and that jumps me to the studio. And within the studio, you can capture your data, build your data sets, um, look at a way of doing signal processing and then finally train and test your machine learning model. Um, because I'm kind of bound to my desk at this point, we're gonna train a machine learning model that can distinguish between four different gestures. So one is me moving the dev board up and down. The other is me moving the waving with the dev board. The other one is the dev board going over my desk, like, like it's a snake. And the last one is just laying idle. And that last one is really important actually, because a machine learning model only performs well if it kind of knows what to expect. 
So um, here, actually having a having some having an idle state, having a state where nothing is happening, is really key. Um, so to get the dashboards connected, I'm plugging it in first, and then I open the the daemon. So there's a little piece of software that runs on my computer that connects over the serial wire to my dev boards and then connects to Edge Impulse. Um, I don't want to connect it over Wi-Fi right now. And then my device shows up here and the device is tapped, my dev board. Um, so with that, I'm, I'm kind of ready to start sampling some data from it. Um, I did a bit of data acquisition already uh, prior to this webinar, but let's start with just some idle data. Um, at this point, we send a signal to the device to capture some data while I'm not doing anything. I'm touching my desk a little bit. Um, and it then sends it over here. So it's basically flat, a little bit of vibration while I'm working on my desk, but that is all fine. Um, so that's one class. So let's add some more, some wave data. All right, so you already see me waving. So you see kind of every wave that I do. Um, I can add some up down data. We're moving the dev board up and down. And the idea is that for kind of an initial model, and it's both for um, data that's coming from the accelerometer and from the microphone, you want about 10 minutes of data. Spread around evenly over those four classes. Um, and that will just give you kind of a good idea whether your machine learning model is going to work initially. Um, so if you look at, oh, I misclassified that, so I can change the label to up down. Um, data sanity is really important. If you start labeling stuff wrongly, then you're going to have a bad time pretty easily. But here we go. So we have um, wave here. In we see quite a bit of difference between wave and up down, right? There's there's lots of noise here, but you see kind of that the movement in generally is is different. However, the program to write some code to actually distinguish between these two things, and especially in the way that many people can do stuff in multiple different ways is going to be really hard. So let's design a, what we call an impulse, where we combine some signal processing and some machine learning to start distinguishing between these. Um, so we start here on the left. Um, we take quite long samples, so five or 10 seconds, but my gestures are less than those five or 10 seconds. So I want to slice this up in little windows first. So it slices up in two second windows, um, and then I use a sliding window to go over the data. So my five second of data, I make many, many windows of those. Um, that helps a little bit with the, with the amount of data I need to capture. Um, then I add a processing block. Um, so this, as I said earlier, a signal processing block makes the amount of data that we need to process a lot less um, and can clean up the data as well. Um, so we ship with a number of blocks for repetitive motion, for audio, um, but you can also plug your own blocks in. So we've got some tutorials on that. So let's start with a, a spectral analysis feature and then a learning block like a neural network. Um, now the first thing that I wanna do if I'm looking at my data here is that my data is really noisy. Um, and all these like little vibrations, all the little difference are not beneficial for me um, because if I'm moving this from left to right, yeah, there's some noise, but I'm not interested in that. So first I wanna remove the noise um, and after that, I want to kind of look in the signal and see where the interesting frequencies are. Um, so set it up here. So the very first thing is denoise the signal. So you see under after filter, it's the same signal, but denoised. And do that by using a low pass filter. Um, and then I do some analysis over the signal. So I plot um, the frequency domain here and plot the, uh, plot the spectral power over here. Um, and kind of the idea here is that when I compare this wave with other wave data, even though it might be captured by someone completely different, the initial frequency domain and spectral power graphs stay relatively the same. So there's sometimes a little bit of difference, but the general movement is kind of the same. And when I use it on up-down, for example, the up-down movement is completely different again. Um, and I can play with these parameters over time, but, but for now, just, just go straight forward. Um, so let's say that I'm kind of happy with my uh, DSP pipeline, I cannot train this model. Um, by doing that, I go over all the data I have in my data sets and then run this feature extraction step. And then with that, I have about five and a half thousand different windows, two second windows, all with a label derived from this 10 minutes of data. And I can plot all of those in one graph to see if my features actually make any sense. 
Um, so let's take the height of the first peak, the height of the, the height of the first peak and all the three different axes. Um, and you see that my data is already kind of cleaned up quite nicely. So you see a very big cluster here of wave data on the, on the right. Um, I see a cluster of up-down data here. I see that snake is definitely different from idle, very similar to other things. So by doing, uh, by choosing my features wisely, I can start distinguishing between my classes already very nicely. Um, if you see that lots of data is still clustered together and you can't distinguish it nicely yourself, a machine learning model will probably also be, have a really hard time doing this. So you can, you can plot this data to help you um, doing that. Um, so with that happy, let's, let's train a small neural network. Um, the, the immediate step that you see here, because the feature extraction pipeline is that we have lots less features. So we have two seconds worth of data, but at high resolution, so 400 data points or so. Afterwards, we only have 33 features, so much smaller. We make a very small neural network um, and let's train that, but only train it for a very, very tiny bit. And you'll see that the network will perform very, very poorly at the beginning because we're trying to find this, this mathematical function that describes our data set, but at the moment we don't give it any time to adjust those parameters. So it kind of thinks that everything is snake. Um, so very poor, poor accuracy, kind of just guessing, except for, uh, for idle snake. So um, let's train it a little bit extra and then I'll, I'll talk about on-device performance. Um, so we see also what we expect the on-device performance to be. So we think that the inferencing time here will be about six milliseconds um, and we see about peak memory usage of about 5K. Um, and this is directly correlated to the number of um, neural network layers that you have here. So if you add an extra one, um, this will go up. So you have a bit of a, a feeling of what it's gonna be. And these are device performance numbers running on the STI to discovery kits. Um, so after a few, after a minute or so, we have much better performance, but maybe a little bit too good. We think right now we have 100% performance. Typically, if you see that in a neural network or in a machine learning model, that means it's overfit. It knows very well about your training data, but it's not very good at, at doing stuff in the wild. Um, but yeah, let's try it out. So um, let's see if it actually works nice or not. So I have my, I go to live classification, and then once again, I can get data from my dev board. Um, we upload it to Edge Impulse and then we ask it to classify, see what is happening. So let's do me some waving. And all right, that was classified. It's, it took 38 windows, 38 two second windows from this five seconds of data. And I thought that all of those were wave. So it actually works surprisingly well, at least on this data. Naturally, you need lots of data to also test whether your machine learning model works. Um, so now let's, let's try something what the, what the model can't do. Um, and neural networks are really bad at encountering data they've never seen before at all. So let me just shake vividly. So this is nothing like up, down, or wave, or anything that we've done before. We'll see what the network thinks. Um, so I thought all of this was up down and it's very confident about this as well. So it thinks it's a hundred percent chance that this is up down, but of course this is not true. Um, and if I, and if this is a crucial part of my, um, device deployment, this means that it might, um, uh, draw the wrong conclusions from this. So this is, this is terrible. Actually, we can't trust the neural network here. Now, fortunately, if we look at the feature explorer here again, um, and I have my, uh, my four classes, up down is blue, wave is orange, idle is uh, green and snake is red. And then I plot my data that I just collected in uh, purple. I see that it's very far outside of any known cluster. Um, and that's something I can take advantage of. Um, so let's add a second uh, machine learning block, which is a anomaly detection block where we cluster and then see if the data is like any of the data we've seen before. So now we have one signal processing block and two learning blocks. Um, we just train it on the three axes that we just saw, just for clarity. Um, and after a few seconds, we've, we've known all the clusters of our data. Um, so all the dark spots are data that we've seen before in our training set and all the, um, the circles are, are clusters that we, that we trust. 
Um, and when I compare this to the waving that I did earlier, this fits nicely within the clusters. So this was definitely not an anomaly. This is stuff we, where we trusted. Um, but when I go back to life classification and once again shake vividly, Um, we'll now also run classification on the second block. Um, and here, even though the network still thought it was up-down, we now override it and say, well, no, here we don't trust the neural network. This was an anomaly. So we need to flag this as an anomaly. So really flexible. Um, so we got a model now. Let's, let's test it against some data that we've never seen before um, and see how well it performs. Um, so what we do here now is we go over all the data that's we've kind of put aside in a, in a special bucket. And then we ask the model to classify this and, and tell us like, what do you think that the accuracy should be? Um, it is not just the accuracy of the neural network, it's the accuracy of the signal processing pipeline, the anomaly detection code, and then the neural network combined. Um, and still doing really, really well. This is probably better than you could expect normally in the field. Um, but for now it works well. And we see that a couple of anomalies are detected. Um, and that's something we could like, we had to go in and fix because apparently we're missing some training data. So from there, let's deploy it. So the easiest format that we have is just deploy it as a C++ library. So this is a, a library without any dependencies um, that runs on kind of everything, like small, um, uh, small microcontrollers. Um, so in here we have our SDK which runs on basically everything. We have our model parameters, uh, which tells us like how long do you sample, how many layers do you have? And then we use TensorFlow here. So we give you a TensorFlow light model for just a neural network. So really easy to deploy. Um, if you have the dev port sitting here, I can just deploy as a binary. Um, this builds a firmware package specifically for this dev port. Um, and we can run it on device and then test that the inferencing actually works there. And then we can also see what the performance metrics are. So I save this and then I drag this file onto the, the dev board to flash. So it's flashing uh, yellow and red at the moment. All right, stop the daemon. And in a second when it stops flashing, All right. All right, so here we go. So this is a view on the device. So this is not running in Edge Impulse anymore. We're, we're running without a connection. Um, and I can ask my device to, to run the same inferencing pipeline. Um, so I run AT run Impulse. Um, so we see we have two seconds of sampling time. We have four classes. We run a DSP, which does about 60 milliseconds. Then we run the classification, and then we run anomaly. So this whole pipeline, two seconds of data, Full analysis with a neural network block, signal processing block, and anomaly detection, we can do in 18 milliseconds, which is really, really fast. So let me do a movement up and down. So we think it's up down now. Um, then let me do some wave. And now do me do some shaking. Um, so before this, you saw that we thought it was wave 100% of the time, so classified correctly. Um, and then last, I did my, my shaking, so it still thought it was up down, but we override it because we say an anomaly score of three, which is much higher than we normally tolerate. So there we go, full machine learning model now running on device. Um, if you have, now naturally we can do this for much more than just accelerometer data. Um, and if you don't have the device itself, we can also use our mobile phone to do that. So let's go to the keyword spotting project here. Then I'll take my phone. Out, so I'm just using uh, my iPhone XS. And here's a, a screen of my phone. Um, and let's add my phone actually as a, as a device to, do, uh, to get some data from my impulse. So on the devices tab, I can connect a new device, use my mobile phone, get a QR code. And uh, now my phone is here. So phone K8JWM4H4 um, is sitting there. Um, so what I have here is a simple keyword spotting model. So we have three classes. Um, yes, 
uh, no uh, noise. Um, those are the three classes that I want to distinguish between. Um, and from here, I can now sample data in exactly the same way as I can from my phone as I could earlier from the device. So let's add a little bit of noise data um, and look at my phone on the left here. All right, so this is a little bit of noise data. I mean, you can't hear it right now and I can add some yes sample here as well. Yes. All right, so now we have yes here. Now, very similarly, we have a signal processing pipeline that consists of a way of windowing the data. So we look at a second word of data. Um, then we have an audio block to extract some features there and then another neural network. So our audio block looks yeah, we look at uh, capsule coefficients here. So you see, um, for, for example, no, you see lots of energy here in the middle. And then if you look at, for example, some noise data, so this is a, a guy meowing, it's lots more stuff in the higher frequencies. Um, and then we have a small neural network, a convolutional neural network here. So we make, this, this network is a lot bigger than what we had previously. Um, um, we can still run that on device. So on device performance here, we think about 200 milliseconds for a second worth of audio data. So that's still a real time enough. And a peak memory usage of about 34K. Um, so we've already trained that model. Um, and then when I wanna use this on my phone, um, I can click on the switch to classification mode. What we then do is instead of building our signal processing and neural network uh, libraries, for the discovery kit, we actually make a WebAssembly package and then push it to the phone. So I switch and then I go to classification mode. Yes. Yeah. Uh, sorry, misclassify. <laughs> That's no there. Um, should have put the new way. But yeah, so here, very easy. Build your neural network, build your signal processing pipeline, put it on device, whether it's your um, IoT discovery kit or whether it's your um, phone sitting here in a very, very trivial manner. Just literally go take something that can get sensor data, collect it, build this whole data set out, um, and then redeploy it back onto something that can run in real time on your devices. Um, so yeah, the last thing, like really, the only way that's, that this makes sense and we'll switch to Q&A is like get started yourself. This is really cool, like having sensor data in your hand and then training a machine learning model to run this on device is super, super, super cool. And it's really easy to get started yourself and you, you really feel the power. Like for me, running my first ML uh, algorithm that was doing gesture detection um, uh, on, a, on a real phone was for me, or a real device was kind of like the hello world again, hello world in, in what I did when I was 10 years old and, and doing Visual Basic 6. You get the power back into your back into your hands. Um, so yeah, go to Edge Impulse to get started. You can use your phone, the IT discovery kit. Um, also, one of my colleagues, Dan, um, wrote together with Pete Ward in this book, uh, the tinymailbook.com, which is really great. Five hundred pages full of resources on you know, why it makes sense, what the use cases are, etc. So really, go and get started yourself. Um, so as a recap, the ML hype is really real. It's a very powerful technology. Um, there's lots of amazing companies that are working really, really hard in bringing this to any device. Um, and it's a perfect fit with sensors. Sensor data is raw and messy. We throw lots and lots of stuff away. Combining some on-device machine learning with all these sensors, that is a really perfect fit. Um, so literally start using the remaining 99% of your sensor data. And if you do it on Edge Impulse, that's fantastic. And we really want to hear about it. Um, so with that, thank you. And I want to have the last 10 minutes for Q&A. And the slides you can find already at yamnewman.com. Hey, everybody. Zach here. So thank you for, for the attention and the, the awesome comments and, and questions on live during Jan's presentation. Um, I've been busy uh, typing furiously on my keyboard answering questions uh, during the presentation. So we've got 25 um, questions we've already answered. Um, please do take a look uh, through existing questions. And we've got 52 open questions. And, yeah. and what I'm going to do is just, I'm going to pick out some, some, um, some good questions here, and we'll, we'll talk about those with, with Jan. 
Um, and one that's come up really often is about portability. Um, we've had some people ask, uh, could this run on an ESP32? Um, will we be doing new boards, et cetera? And Jan, why don't, why don't you give a few words about that porting yeah. and inference too? Yeah, so we try to make it as easy as possible to do the porting here. So um, we have a, a few libraries on, that you need on device to capture data to make it a little bit easier. Um, those are all written in very portable code. So either C99 or C11. Um, so you can run those pretty straightforward. Um, kind of the way that you get, as long as you can get data from a sensor interface um, into something, maybe an SD card or over serial, you can get the data into Edge Impulse. Um, if you then want to run the machine learning model on device, the only thing you need is a, is a, is a modern C++ compiler. Now, for some part, I'm not too sure, I'm not too familiar with the ESP32, but for some parts, like running a small neural network really fast, it's really nice to use the vector extensions on the device. Um, so we've made extensions for, uh, that run on any ARM device to make it run really fast. For example, if you have a floating point unit, we'll use that to make it faster. Um, there we might do, need to do a little bit of work. We would love to support you in that as well. Um, and we'll, we'll have some first party support of new boards coming out as well, um, including a board from Ada Compute, which is a really, really cool low power part. Um, and then we're working uh, on, on a new cool part that lots of people have um, that will come out later this year. Uh, another question that's come up um, pretty often here is about power consumption. and. and how low, how low power is this? And do you need special hardware to, to achieve battery power? Yeah, um, it kind of goes with everything. It depends how often you do it. Um, so the, the ST board, for example, um, if we don't do anything, so in the little inferencing demo, we kind of we were quiet for two seconds and then we sample and then we run the, the machine learning algorithm. You can tune it very nicely. So the, the board already goes to about 50, um, uh, micro, microamps, yeah, uh, 0 0.005 uh, milliamps um, in deep sleep mode automatically when you're not doing anything. Then when you capture data from the sensor, you can do it at a very, uh, at a low power setting. And they only need to burst the moment that you run your machine learning model. And that is in this case only 10 milliseconds every second. Um, so you still need to do a bit of duty cycling, but it's much, much, much more efficient than driving the radio. So uh, the guys at ARM, for example, were saying that they could do still Im detecting objects and still images on a coin cell for about a year every five seconds before the battery was run out. So this is, this is pretty amazing. Um, naturally, anything with embedded systems, nothing, is, nothing happens magically automatically. You still need to think about this and measure it. You can go really, really low um, with this kind of use case. Another um, great question was about uh, being able to open up a model and a data set in a data science tool like a Python notebook or SageMaker and then can you bring it back in again? Good question. Yeah, so we have a couple of extension points. Um, so we don't lock any data in. So any data we generate from the output of your signal processing pipeline to the TensorFlow models that we generate, you can just pull out. Um, but also if you rather work with your own data science tools, um, from the neural network block, you can just go to the advanced menu, say edit this IPython notebook, and that will give you a Python notebook with all the data already pulled in from our APIs, where you can just start experimenting with different architectures, uh, data sanitation, et cetera. Um, to bring it back, we put all the interesting stuff for us in a single cell in the IPython notebook. And as long as you keep everything there, you can just copy and paste that back into Edge Impulse, and then you keep the whole flow in that. Um, so definitely, definitely a way forward. How are we doing on time, Katie? We've got five minutes left, okay. Um, so in a similar light, um, quite a few people asked about specialized algorithms, like can I do principal component analysis or what, I ha what if I have some really specialized data like ultrasound radar, for example, um, do our signal processing blocks and neural network machine learning box work for that? Um, yes, and a little, yeah, most, mostly yes. Um, so you can, if you have a sensor, if you have a novel uh, sensor, 
for example, something with, with ultrasound, um, you can plug in your own uh, processing blocks in any language. Um, we have some examples available in Python um, into Edge Impulse. So then we can do the feature extraction from there. Um, that, however, um, we don't have automatic like code conversion to run this on device then. So it requires a little bit of work there, but you can do the initial full onboarding on that sensor data uh, from it. Um, PCA at this point, we don't do in Edge Impulse, um, but it's something I wanna bring in very, very soon. And there's a couple of other really novel, um, uh, really novel techniques in uh, reducing the number of features um, in some recent papers. So that we're also gonna, gonna look at and see what makes most sense from a uh, engineering standpoint. But yeah, even if, even if that's kind of the endpoint for a Jimples, you can always use it for data collection, initial feature extraction, and then just take the output there as a NumPy array or NumPy file and just import it into your own pool and then and keep working on that. So very extensively. Yeah, it's important to remember that we don't make all the algorithms. We're the place that, that hosts and makes it all work. So you can always implement a custom algorithm on a yep. Um A similar question came up about um, conventional ML techniques versus neural networks and what we think about that and do we support classical ML? Yeah, yeah at this point we do a couple of classical ML blocks. So uh, anomaly detection is the, is the most clear one based on clustering. Um, We'll add more depending on what we see is necessary. What I really like about classic ML is that very often it is, I can explain what happens. Um, with neural networks, it's, it's kind of hard if you are going to deploy a model on, on, on hundreds of thousands of devices that go into the wild and that then need to run without any supervision. It's kind of scary to say, here's a black box. Yes, it will go, yes it's gonna work. Um, so for us, we always deploy it with a classical ML ML algorithm on the side, just to, as kind of a safety, safety guard or something. And the neural network might do it better, um, but we like the, the certainty of things and actually know when something goes awry. Um, so you can flag that and send it back. So there's definitely a place for this um, in there. Great. Um, last one, I think. <laughs> last one, yeah. So, we had quite a few people asking about cameras and will we do anything with images? And you know, is the same technique of tiny ML even applicable to images? And you know, where, where does the boundary end if it's possible? Yeah, As, yeah. Um, video, no, not at this point at least. Um, still images, not at the moment with Natch Impulse, but definitely something that we'll be adding in the coming year. Um, it also depends a bit what you want to do. So if you want to do a classification of 10 different types of objects in still images, yeah, totally going to work. If you want to run full image net on your, on your device, not going to work. Do full, video, full resolution video, also not going to work. So you need to work a little bit with, with the constraints that you have. For still images, stuff like people counting, for example, uh, animal spotting, um, definitely something that's, uh, that's going to be in the pipeline. Yeah, and keep in mind that you can run these algorithms also on higher powered computer. Sure. There's nothing that limits this to MCU. You could deploy on a Cortex-A, a Raspberry Pi, and you can deploy larger models and our infrastructure will support that. So, so there, is, there is a little bit beyond TinyML that, that you can use this for. But there also are great tools for full rate video and, and facial detection and things like that. So, so we're not trying to, to replace those, we're trying to bring ML into all the other applications and low power devices. Thank you everyone for attending, um, great session. Uh, thank you, Haxter and Katie for, for hosting us. Yeah, thank you, uh, Jan and Zach. And thank you everyone, this has been amazing. There's so much engagement. Um, I had posted earlier the link to the forums. Um, and so if you didn't get your question answered, you can always jump over to that. I will also include that in the follow-up email that will be sent in, in the next day or two with the recording, as long as, a, as well as the slides that Jan uh, presented today. So you guys will all get that and um, be able to watch through this a couple more times and get some of those questions answered. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us, whatever time of day it was. I know a lot of you, you were uh, late at night, so we appreciate you staying up late for us and um, participating. Thanks, Zach and Jan. Right. Have a great day. Thanks, Katie. Bye. Bye.